So welcome back to this latest video on 162 Maths and in this video we're going over the practice paper 2023 on the higher tier set for paper 1 which is a non-calculated paper. Now as always I'll include a question breakdown in the description below so you can see which question refers to which mathematical topic. So let's get started on this practice paper for 2023 set for paper 1 which is a non-calculated paper on the higher tier. So looking at question 1, so here what we've got is we've got to simplify this algebraic expression so here what we've got to do is basically multiply the numbers together so we've got 8 times 4 which is 32 then we've got to use our knowledge of indices to then work with the variables so looking at x I've got x squared multiplied by x so I add the powers so that's going to be x to the power of 3 and then with the y's I do exactly the same so I've got y cubed times multiplied by y cubed which gives me y to the power of 6, remembering that we add the powers. Then for question 2, it says work out the gradient of the straight line. So again, here what we need to do is just rearrange this formula so we've got it as y as the subject. So I've got 3x minus 1, and then the gradient is going to be the coefficient of x, which is positive 3. Then moving on to question 3, so here we are expanding the bracket. So 3 times 2x is 6x minus 3 times 5, which is 15. 4 times 2x is 8x, and 4 multiplied by 1 is 4. So then collecting the x's, I've got 6 plus 8, which is 14, and then I've got minus 15 plus 4, which is minus 11. Moving on to question 4, it says the a circle has a radius of 4 centimetres, two diameters split the circle into four sections as shown. The area of section A to the area of section B is in the ratio of 1 to 3. Work out the area of section A, give your answer in terms of pi. Now for this, the key bit of information is that A and D, or A and B, both make a half of the circle. So if we look at the ratios, so if I just label this as one part, B as three parts, then C is going to be exactly the same as A because they're opposite angles and they've got the same radius of a sector, so that's also going to be one part and D is also going to be the same as B. So in total what we've got is we've got eight parts. So from this we know that the total area of the circle is going to be using pi r squared, so that's going to be pi times the radius which is 4 squared, so that's going to be 16 pi. So that's the total, so then working out the ratio, well a is one part out of 8 and I multiply that by 16 pi and then that then becomes 16 pi over 8 if I just turn that into two fractions and the 16 and the 8 cancel down to give me an answer of 2 pi. Then moving on to question 5 it says that the table shows information about the times for 100 people to complete a task. The shortest time was 2 minutes 50 seconds. Work out the greatest possible range of times. Now the range is basically the slowest or the shortest or the longest time I should say. So it's the longest minus the shortest time. Now looking at the intervals the highest value that time can be is going to be 20 minutes so it's going to be 20 minutes minus 2 minutes and 50 seconds and that's going to give me an answer of 17 minutes and 10 seconds. Then moving on to 5b it says Jack says the median time is exactly 10 minutes give your reason why he must be incorrect. Well there's uh, several reasons in which he's going to be incorrect uh, by assuming it's going to be 10 is because we know that the median, you want to write something along the lines for the one mark, is that the median is between 10 and 15, so not actually 10, so can be between uh, any number uh, that is more than 10 it can't be 10 and less or equal to 15. So something along those lines would be absolutely fine. Now always make sure that you are, even though it's only worth one mark, that you are adding a little bit of detail. So not only possibly 
get highlighting the mistake, but also giving an example of what the right answer should be. Then moving on to question six, it says that a bag contains 20 counters, 19 are blue, one is yellow, two counters are taken out at random without replacement. If the two counters are the same color, what is the probability that the next counter taken at random is gonna be yellow? Well, if two counters are taken out and they're the same color, then those two counters must be blue. And the reason why, because we've only got one yellow, so you can't have two counters that are both yellow. So the first two counters are gonna be blue. So that means that the one yellow counter is still there. And if I've taken two counters from 20 and have not replaced them, then that means there's gonna be 18 counters left. So my final answer for the probability of getting a yellow is gonna be one over 18. The next question then says, if two counters are different colors, what's the probability of the next counter taken at random being yellow? Well, if they're two different colors, then the yellow has already been taken, so that means that there's no yellow counters in there. So the probability of getting a yellow is therefore gonna be zero. Then moving on to question seven, it says list, let me just get rid of that cursor. It says list the whole numbers that satisfy both these inequalities. Well, for this first one here, what you want to do is want to make x a subject. So I'm going to take the four over. So what I end up with is x is less than great, uh, positive four. Then if I imagine my number line, so I'm starting off, let's say, with minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, get a little bit extra. Then I know that these two numbers are between minus two and four and I want the numbers in between. So if I'm looking at the whole numbers, it's gonna be minus one, zero, one, two, and three. So I'm gonna write minus one, zero, one, two, and three. Then moving on to question eight, it says y is directly proportional to x, complete the tables. Now, if y is directly proportional to x, then I need to be multiplying x by a number to get y. So looking at the values that they've given, I need to know, well, what do I multiply seven to get 63? Well, that's gonna be multiplying by nine. So then to find this number here, I multiply four by nine, which gives me 36, and then zero times nine, which gives me zero. So my two missing numbers are gonna be zero and 36. And then for question nine, here what I wanna do is for this number here, I just wanna substitute x equals minus one into this equation here. So it's gonna be, and if I'm just mess this all up, so we're gonna have minus one squared minus, um, been a bit hasty with the bracket there, so let me just, so I've got two minus one. Minus one squared is positive one, and two times minus one is minus two, but I've got a minus there, so it becomes minus minus two. They become a plus, so this is gonna be a three. For this one here, it's gonna be two squared minus two times two, which is zero. And then for my third missing number, it's gonna be three squared minus two lots of three. So that's gonna be nine minus six, which is three. Then what I then need to do is to plot those coordinates. So here I've got minus one at positive three, so that's gonna be there. At zero, it's zero. At one, it's minus one. At two, it's zero, and at three, it's at positive three. Then all I then need to do, and again, this can be a little bit difficult on the graph, on the computer, sorry, is to join those points up, going through all the coordinates that you've plotted, and just going that little bit extra. So you should have like a, a U-shaped parabola going through all the points. And again, I know that mine is slightly off, but hopefully yours will be a lot neater. It then says work out the, write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph. Well, the turning point is gonna be at this point here, although my graph may say otherwise, but it's gonna be one minus one. Now with question 10, it says, using a ruler and a compass, construct a triangle ABC so that BC is perpendicular to AB and AC is nine centimeters. So for this, first of all, what we need to do is we need to create a 90 degree angle at B. Now, typically this is not the easiest thing and this tends to be not covered as well uh, in lessons, but I'll show you how, hopefully how we do this. So first things first, what you're gonna need to do is with a ruler, you wanna extend the line AB. So again, you wanna make sure that you're using a sharp pencil 
and a ruler. And so if I just extend that line, it looks something like that. Now the next thing you then want to do is set your compass up. So again, when setting up your compass, you want to make sure you've got a sharpish pencil and that when you close the compass, you want to make sure that the pin and the pencil are as close as possible. Then what you then want to do is with your compass is you then want to just pick a comfortable length between the pencil and the compass and just draw an arc where it insets the line AB and drew, draw a similar arc without adjusting the compass on either side. So then from this, what you've then found is that the B point is the midpoint between these two intersection points. And now what you're going to do is you're going to do a perpendicular bisector between these two points. So what you do is with your compass, you mark a distance that's more than halfway. So as you can see, that's what I've done there. And then you just want to draw an arc in the middle. Then without adjusting your compass, you do exactly the same, but from the other point. And what you should find is you've now got two arcs that intersect at these two points. Then with the ruler, what you then want to do is draw your line through these. Now, your common sense might be telling you, why can't I just use a protractor? Well, the reason for that is because it doesn't say you can use a protractor in the question. I know it doesn't say it doesn't say you can't use one, but it does say using a compass and ruler. So you want to make sure that you're showing all your perpendicular lines and your arcs because that acts as your working out. So I'm just going to mark that angle as a right angle. The next thing that's left for me to do is to look at the line AC, which is nine centimeters. So with my compass and my ruler, I'm going to try and carefully mark where nine centimeters is going to be, which is stretching the compass out quite a lot. And I'd say I'm probably happy with that. And then what you then want to do is put the pin on A and draw an arc so it intersects the perpendicular line you've just drawn. So mine is going to be at this point here. So that point there is where C is going to be. And then the only thing that's left for me to do is then with my pencil, which I'm going to do with the pen, just so it comes up clear on the screen, is then join A with C. And I've got my triangle just there. Now, I've just noticed that the light isn't great. So if I just hover my hand, hopefully you can see all my construction lines on the screen so you can see what I've done. And again, a little reminder, do not rub out any of those construction lines because the marker is gonna to wanna to see that you've used a ruler and a compass to construct the triangle ABC. Then moving on to question 11, it says, John is drawing a quadrilateral. The length of each side is 5.2 centimeters to one decimal place. Complete the error interval for the length of one side. So here, if we're rounding up to one decimal place, well, one decimal place is 0.1. So if I divide that by two, I get 0 0.05. So to get the error interval, I need to do 5.2 plus or minus 0.05, which gives me an answer of 5.15 and 5.25. It then says complete the error interval for the perimeter. Well, in terms of the smallest perimeter, well, that's going to be four times 5.15, which is 20.6. And then the largest perimeter is going to be four times 5.25, which is 21. Then moving on to question 12, we want to solve this equation. So here I get rid of the seven by multiplying by seven. So I end up with five y plus one equals 21. Take the one over by taking away. So I end up with five y equals 20 and then divide by five, which gives me y equals four. For question 12b, we want to factorize this. So hopefully you would have spot that it's a difference of two squares. So if I set up my two brackets, what do I have to square to get 25 x squared? Well, that's going to be five x. And then what do I have to square to get minus nine? Well, that's going to be three or three. And one's a plus, one's a minus. And don't forget we're solving this. So then looking at this, we've got five x plus three equals zero or five x minus three equals zero. So doing a bit of rearranging to make x a subject, I get x equals minus three fifths. And with this one, I get x equals positive three fifths. So the answer is going to be plus or minus three fifths 
or you could write it as plus or minus 0.6 or you could write it um, as separate so you can write minus 3 over 5 or positive 3 over 5 any which way would be absolutely fine moving on to question 12 C so here we've got a fraction and my X is the denominator so what I want to do is put brackets around the denominator and then take that denominator over the other side to get rid of the fraction so here we've got 5 equals 3 lots of x plus 2 then expand the bracket so I end up with 3x plus 6 take the 6 over so I end up with minus 1 equals 3x and then divide by 3 giving me a final answer of x equals 1 third moving on to question 13 it says that an audience of 21,000 attended a concert in the Manchester arena Adult tickets cost £30 and children ticket cost £10. The ratio of ad adults to children at the concert was 5 to 2. How much was taken in ticket sales? So first things first, what we're wanting to do is to work out how many children, how many adults there were. So we divide 21,000 by the total number of parts, which is 7, in which I get an answer of 3,000. So each part equals 3,000 people. So then to work out the number of adults, that's going to be 5 parts multiplied by 3,000, uh, 3, and that gives me 15,000 adults. Then for the children, that's going to be 2 parts, so that's going to be 2 times 3,000, which is 6,000. Then from this, what I then want to do is then multiply each of those numbers by the ticket price, so that's going to be multiplied by 30. The children's going to be multiplied by 10. And that gives me an answer of 45,000 plus, uh, what, 450,000 multiplied by, uh, sorry, added to 60,000. And that gives me a total of 510,000. Then moving on to question 14, it says cans of cola are sold as follows. So single cans cost 70 pence and it's buy two, get one free. Packs of four cost £2.40 with a special offer of two packs for £4. And one offer is packs of 20 for £5.50. And the question is saying work out the cheapest way to buy 18 cans. So for this, generally what you're looking at is to find any which way. And now you can mix it up. You don't have to only buy the 18 cans with one offer. You can mix the offers, which is really important, particularly when you're knowing what the final answer is gonna be. Now, for four marks, what you need to do is make sure that you are showing at least three combinations before being selective of the correct answer. So here, if I just have, let's say, I'm just gonna buy the single cans. Now, if it's buy two, get one free, then I'm gonna be getting three cans for the price of two, which is £1.40. So that means then how many three cans go into 18 cans? I'm going to need six. So it's going to be six times £1.40, which comes up to a total of £8.40. So that's one offer that I've got so far. If I then go for offer two, so packs of four, so basically two packs cost £8. So then looking at packs of four, Well, for this, I'm going to get eight cans for eight for four pounds. So then to get 18, I'm going to need to buy two of those offers. So I'm going to be eight plus eight, which is 16. And then I need to buy two singles. And so that's going to come up to four pounds plus four pounds plus one pound 40. Well, actually, I'm going to get a free can, so there we go. So we actually comes up to a total of £9.40. Then we move on to the packs of 20, uh, 12. So if I just then write packs, oh, let's go for a different colour. So we're going for packs of 12. Well, for this, I need 12 cans and then I need to buy another six. So six singles. Well, 12 cans cost £5.50. And then six singles, well, I'll get three cans for £1.40. 
So that's then six cans is then going to cost me £2.40. So then working out the price of that, it then comes up to a total of um, £5.50 plus £2.40. And that's going to come to, or £2.80 rather. Let me just correct that. £2.80 and that comes up to a total of £8.30 and pence. And so the cheapest way of getting this, and there's actually, that is the cheapest way, is £8.30 and that's from buying the 12 pack plus six singles in which it's two uh, or three for two. And there we go. Then moving on to question 15, it says the diagram shows earnings of 80 part-time workers. How many workers earn more than 70 pounds? Now the key thing is to remember is that there are 80 workers. So the graph ends at 80. So looking at this, we then find 70 pounds, which is here. We then project upwards till we hit the community of frequency polygon, it looks like. And then we then go across. So 60 people earn less. than 70 pounds. So the answer then is going to be 80 take away 60, which is 20. Then moving on to question 15b, it says find the interquartile range. Well, if I just get rid of that arrow to begin with, now typically in the exam you wouldn't have done that, but I'm going to do it just to make it a little bit clearer. So we've got 80, half of 80 is 40. So this is the median line. But I'm not interested in the median, I need the interquartile range. So I need the upper quartile, which is going to halfway between 40 and 80, which is 60. So this is the upper quartile, and that is 70. And the lower quartile is going to be halfway between 0 and the median, which is 20. So that's going to be 40. So the upper quartile is 70. The lower quartile is 20 and so 40. So then the IQR is going to be 70 minus 40, which gives me an answer of 30. Then moving on to question 16, eight says write down the value of sine 30. So this is just an exact value of trig in which you should have a half or 0.5. Then moving on to question 16b, so it says, given that the area of the triangle is 12 centimetres square, find the value of x. Well, the formula for the area of a triangle without knowing the perpendicular height is a half AB sine C. So if I just label this triangle, so that's going to be my A, that's going to be my B, in which you could add those in any order, and this is my angle C. Then what I end up is with half times 8 times x times sine 30 equals 12. Now I know that sine 30 is a half. So I've got a half times 8 times x equals 12. Now all of this simplified is going to give me, well if I turn this into a fraction, 1 times 8 times x times 1 is just 8x over 2 times 1 times 2, I should put a 1 there, is going to give me 4 equals 12 so 2x equals 12 so x equals 6 so the answer then is 6 then moving on to question 17 a it says work out the value of 8 to the power of minus 2 well the minus makes it a reciprocal so that becomes 1 over 8 squared and 8 squared is 64 so the correct answer is 1 over 64 then for 17b, it says solve 4x equals 8 to the power of 2 thirds. Now for this, what you need to do is change the basis. So we can write 4 as a power of 2. So 4 equals 2 squared. So then what I can then do, and 8 is 2 cubed. So then rewriting 4x. So if I just write the question like so, I can replace the 4 with 2 squared x, and I can replace the 8 with 2 cubed 2 thirds. 
Then multiplying out the powers, I get 2 to the power of 2x equals 2 to the power, well, 3 lots of 2 thirds is just going to give me 2. Then if the base numbers are the same, but the powers are different, then that means that the powers must be equal to each other. So 2x equals 2, so x must equal 1. Then uh, alternately, what you could, uh, could you have done that? Well, you can work out what 8 of 2 thirds is, another way of doing it, and that's going to be 8 squared to the cube root. Well, 8 squared is 64, so if you do the cube root of 64, well, that's going to equal 4. So 4x equals 4, and then you can then work out that x equals 1. That's another alternative way that you could have got the same answer. Then for 17c, it says simplify this expression. Well, 3 to the power of 0 is 1. 3 to the power of 1 is 3, and 3 squared is 9. So substituting all of those in, we get 1 times bracket, then we've got 3 plus 9, which equals then root 12, and then we can rewrite root 12 as root 4 times root 3. Root 4 is 2, so it becomes 2 root 3. Then moving on to question 18, it says the velocity time graph shows the journey of a car and it says estimate the deacceleration at t equals 2 seconds. So if I just make a point there, then what you need to do then do is to draw a triangle where or draw a tangent to that point and then with a straight line with a ruler, which clearly I didn't do, but you're just giving you getting you the, giving you the point. And then you turn that into a right angle triangle. And then what you then want to do is do the height divided by the base. So the gradient is going to be the height divided by the base of the gradient. Now make sure that you're not just counting the little squares. Make sure that you're using the scale of each of those. So looking at mine, I get a base, a height of four and a base of one. So then my gradient then is going to be four, which is four over one which equals four. Now looking at the mark scheme, they would accept an answer anywhere between three and five. But like I said, my answer was four, which falls nicely um, between the two values in the range. Then moving on to question 19, it says, here are six cards. Two cards are picked at random. Assume that the first card chosen is not replaced. Work out the probability that both cards are gonna be B. Well, the probability for the first card being chosen at random is going to be B, is going to be 2 out of 6. Then the probability of the next card is going to be B. Well, there's only one left, and there's a total of 5. So then working through this, I've got 2 times 1, which is 2, 6 times 5, which is 30. And that fraction then simplifies to give me 1 over 15. The next question then says, in fact, the first card was replaced. How does this affect your answer in part A? Well, the question or the, the option you need to tick is the first one. The probability now is going to be bigger. And the reason for that is because the probability of getting a B is has been increased. Because one third is bigger than one fifth. So something along those lines would be good enough to get the full marks for that. Then moving on to question 20. So here we've got a composite function question. So it says work out the composite function of f g of x. And you want to give your answer as ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b and c are integers. So looking at this, what we want to do is now we're substituting g of x into f. So for this, I put brackets around g of x and then underline the x in f of x. So what I'm going to do is that in f of x, I'm going to swap that x with the bracket. So f g of x then equals 2. Now instead of writing x, I'm going to write x plus 5, and that's squared. So then expanding this out, well, I've got to do the power first. So that then, looking at this, is going to be x plus 5, x plus 5 which then becomes two lots of x squared plus 10x plus 25. And then expanding the bracket, I get 2x squared plus 20x plus 50. So the final answer then is 2x squared plus 20x plus 50. 
Now it doesn't say for me to say what A, B and C are. All I know is that A, B and C in this expression here should be whole numbers, which in my final answer, they are. Then moving on to question 21, it says in this question, all lengths are in centimeters and it gives us the volume of a cone formula and the volume of a sphere. It then tells us that the a sphere has a radius of 2e and a cone has a radius of e and a height of 2t. If the volume of the sphere is equal to the volume of the cone, find the expression 4t in terms of e. So first things first, what we need to do is we want to work out the volume of the cone. Now to do this, I'm going to use this formula and I'm going to use these two bits of information. So R equals E and H equals 2T. So then working with this formula here, I get third multiplied by five multiplied by R, which is E squared times H, which is 2T. Then to convert this, to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to just write everything as a fraction. So one times pi times two e squared times two t gives me an answer of two pi. And again, it doesn't really matter what the order you write this as, e squared t all over three. Then if I then work out the volume of the sphere, and again, I'm gonna use r equals two e, and I'm gonna use this formula here, then what I get is that the volume equals four thirds times pi times, and it's going to be two e cubed. So then expanding the bracket, I'll get four thirds times pi times two cubed, which is eight and e cubed, which is e three. Then doing exactly the same, writing that as a single fraction, I've got, I'll just write this all over one. So I've got four times eight, which is 32 pi e cubed and that's all divided by three. Now what the question tells me is that the two volumes are equal to each other. So then from this what I could then write is two pi e squared t over three equals 32 pi e cubed over three. Now once I've got this I can then start cancelling things out. So for example I can multiply both sides by three, in which that eliminates the denominator. I can divide both sides by two, so that 32 becomes a 16. I can then divide by pi, so that eliminates the pi. And then I can then divide by e squared and take two e's from both sides. So I'm left with this. So what I'm left with is t equals 16 e, and that there is my final answer. Then moving on to our last question, it says the diagram shows two identical rectangles. The width of the rectangle is two centimeters shorter than its length. The distance between the corners of the two rectangles is six centimeters as shown. What is the area of each identical rectangle? Give your answer in third form as simply as possible. So first of all, let's start by calling the length of the rectangle X. Now we know that the width is two centimeters shorter so that then is going to be x minus 2. Now, if I just label this second rectangle, so that's going to be x and that's going to be x minus 2. Then to work out this length here, well, that's going to be the total length, which is x minus x minus 2. And if I simplify all of that, I get an answer of 2. So this line here is going to be 2. I then know that this blue line is x. So then taking this triangle out, and what I end up with, and let me just draw that up here, is I get that this is six, this is two, and this is x. So hopefully you can see that as it's a right angle triangle, I wanna work out what x is, so I need to use Pythagoras. So here I've got x squared plus two squared equals six squared. Then I've got x squared plus 4 equals 36. So x squared equals 32. So x equals the square root of 32. Now I want to simplify this third because I noticed that I can write 32 as root 16 times root 2. And that is 4 root 2. So x equals 4 root 2. Then looking at the rectangle, 
if I just draw that rectangle again, well, I know that that length there is x and that's x minus 2. So that means that the area, oh, what's up in there? So that means that the area of this rectangle is going to be x lots of x minus 2. Well, I know that x equals 4 root 2, so I can write this as 4 root 2 bracket 4 root 2 minus 2. Then expanding the brackets out, well, 4 times 4 is 16. Root 2 times root 2 is root 4. And then minus 4 times 2, which is 8. And then I've got root 2. Now, this becomes 16 times 2, which is 32. So then my final answer is 32 minus 8 root 2. Or I could factorise that by writing 8. And then it's going to be 4 minus root 2. So any of those two answers would be absolutely fine. And that concludes the end of this paper.